The New Man by Maurice Nicole, Chapter 4, The Idea of Good Being Above Truth, Part 1. On several occasions it is recorded in the Gospels that Christ offended the Pharisees by breaking the Sabbath day. This made them especially furious. It seemed to them that even to do good on the Sabbath day was prohibited by their religious laws and scruples. The term Pharisee refers to the inner state of a man who acts only from external laws and prohibitions for the sake of appearances and feels merit in keeping them, in contrast with that of a man who acts genuinely from what is good. This difference is brought out in many illustrations in the Gospels, as in the case of the Good Samaritan who had compassion on the wounded man who had been attacked by robbers, whereas the priest and Levite had passed by on the other side. But the difference is particularly emphasised where the attitude of the Pharisees towards the Sabbath is used as a background. On one occasion in the synagogue Christ healed a man with a withered right hand on the Sabbath. The right hand is mentioned because it represents in the ancient language of parables power to do and so power to do good. The image is used to represent the Pharisees themselves their power of doing good was withered. Before Christ healed the man, he looked round and said to all those present, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good? The attitude of the Pharisees was that the religious laws must be kept literally. Notice that Christ here is not speaking of truth but of good, which is to come first. The quotation from Luke is as follows. And it came to pass on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught and there was a man there, and his right hand was withered, and the scribes and Pharisees watched him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath, that they might find out how to accuse him. But he knew their faults, and he said to the man that had his hand withered, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. And Jesus said unto him, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good, or to do harm, to save a life or to destroy it? And he looked round about on them all, and said unto him, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they were filled with madness, and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. Luke chapter 6, verses 6 to 11. It is clear that this incident has to do with acting primarily from what is good, apart from any other considerations. Christ is putting what is good above what is truth. To the Pharisees, truth was the Mosaic law and the commandments which, taken literally, forbid work on the Sabbath. Six days shalt thou labour and do all thy work, but the seventh is a Sabbath unto the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do no manner of work. The Pharisees put truth above good. What have we to understand here? What great issues lie behind this narrative? We know from history that all religious quarrels and persecutions have arisen from matters of doctrine, that is, from the side of what is the truth, the side of knowledge and opinion alone. If all mankind were charitable, if everyone acted from good, no such quarrels and persecutions would have arisen. If everyone loved his neighbour as much as himself, through the light of his love of God as the source of supreme good, no one would kill or steal or bear false witness and so on. In fact, the Decalogue of Moses, the Ten Commandments written on tables of stone, would not have any significance. But to the Pharisees who lived by the law and did not understand anything, what was written down was more to them than any meaning behind the letter. If man were entirely good, no laws or commandments would be necessary. He would not need to learn any truths, any knowledge. He could not commit murder because he would know from good that it was impossible to do so. How can you do good to your neighbour by murdering him? How can you do good to him by stealing from him? The last five commandments are knowledge about good. The end of all knowledge is only one thing. What is good? There is no other end or meaning in knowledge but good. But today this is lost sight of and people believe that knowledge by itself leads to its own end. This is a mistake. 
all knowledge should lead to good. To what end is mere knowledge leading mankind today? Now if it is asked why is truth necessary at all, the answer is that man is not good. That is, his level of good is very low and there is only one way to raise the level of good in a man. A man's level of good can only be raised by knowledge of truth about a better good. To raise himself he must learn truth. What kind of truth? He must be taught and learn and practice knowledge of truth that belongs to a higher good than the level of good that represents him. For each person represents in himself a certain level of good. To gain a new level of good he must first proceed by knowledge, through learning or knowledge, that is, through knowledge of the truth about how to reach a higher level of good, if he sincerely tries to act from it and see its truth and meaning for himself. He reaches a new level of good, that is, a new level of himself. Once he has reached this level at which the good of all he has learned as knowledge becomes active, he need no longer bother about the steps in knowledge that led him to the stage he has attained. As a rough and inadequate metaphor, a man, while climbing a mountain, must use his knowledge of climbing. Once he has reached the summit, he sees everything in a new way. He sees the new relationship of everything from the height he has reached and need not think what means he had to use to get to that point. The Mosaic Law, or at least the Ten Commandments, are instructions from the side of truth as to how to attain a level of good where, as commandments, they have no further meaning. But if they are taken as an end and not as a means to an end, they become stumbling blocks. Christ then in the passage quoted above is speaking from good and not from literal truth and the Pharisees condemn him and hate him because they hold only to the literal truth. Truth about a higher level can be taken as truth at the level of good a man is at, at his own level. A man then sees this truth that is designed to lead to a higher level of good in terms of the level of good he is at. If his level of good is self-interest and self-love, he can twist the higher truth to suit his vanity, as do all Pharisees in every age. That is, he can entirely misconceive its meaning. What is called the word of God in the Gospels of Truth about what is necessary for the reaching of a higher level of good, that is, what is necessary for inner evolution, for all inner evolution is reaching higher good through knowledge. The problem of the relation of truth and good thus becomes clearer. A new level of good in man cannot be reached directly. It can only be reached by instruction about how to reach it, and instruction must take the form of truth about this higher level of good. That is, it must come first of all in the form of knowledge which a man must learn and apply to his life. Knowledge about higher good must come first as teaching. When it has fulfilled its object, when a man through knowledge of the truth as to how to reach a higher level of good has reached this new good by trying to live it sincerely by his own inner efforts, then this truth or knowledge, which came first, is replaced by the resulting good itself and thereafter the truth or knowledge that led him to this new state takes the second place having fulfilled its object as a conductor to a higher level. That is, what was first becomes second in order, and what was second in order now becomes first. A reversal takes place. Truth first takes the place of good, and then good takes the place of truth. Actually, the six days of labour in the genesis of a man and the seventh day of rest represent six stages of knowledge followed by the reaching of good itself, which is called the Sabbath. So many things, both in the Old and the New Testaments, are said about this reversal of order, or about the first being last and the last first, that it is remarkable that they have not been more genuinely understood, insofar as the psychology underlying real teaching about man and his inner evolution is concerned. People, however, cling to truth as an end and so feel their doctrinal differences, whether religious or political, most easily. In the Old Testament there is the strange story of Jacob imitating or taking the place of Esau, to mention one example of truth first taking the place of good. Jacob impersonated Esau 
by putting goatskins on his hands and neck, for his brother was represented as being covered with hair. He went to his father Isaac, who was almost blind, with an offering of venison, and said, I am Izu, thy firstborn. I have done according as thou badest me. I pray thee sit and eat of my venison, that thy soul may bless me. And Isaac gave him the blessing that belonged to his elder son, Ezu. Good is really first, for God himself is defined and only defined as good. So it is first born. But to reach good, truth must come first. So Jacob takes the place of Ezu. Then again take the curious story of Perez and Zerah, the twin sons of Judah, whose birth is described thus. And it came to pass that one put out a hand, and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. And it came to pass, as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out, and she said, Wherefore hast thou made a bridge for thyself? Therefore his name was called Perez. And afterwards came out his brother, that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was Zerah. Genesis chapter 38, verses 28 to 30. Why should this be recorded unless it has some deeper meaning? Again, there is the strange story of Manasseh, the firstborn, and Ephraim, the secondborn, the twin children of Joseph, who were brought to Jacob to be blessed. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. Thus Jacob put his hands crosswise. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. And his father refused. That's Genesis 48, verses 13, 14, 18, 19. Here, then, is a crossing or reversal of hands. If you realise that truth must come first in any inner development and good comes as a result, and that then good comes first and truth becomes second, you will grasp one meaning of this crossing of hands. All these allegories refer to the psychological situation of man now on earth in relation to his possible evolution. Man on earth now can no longer be taught good directly, but he is still capable of being taught good through knowledge of truth. Part 2. Did mankind ever act from good? The ancient allegory in Genesis where it is said that the whole earth was of one language and one speech has already been quoted. This refers to an age where men acted from good, for good only can give a common language or agreement. There was a time when men did not act from theories of right and wrong, from different ideas of truth, from different doctrines, from different aspects of knowledge. They acted, first, from the inner recognition of what is good. This united everyone, for good is the only power that can unite. All harmony is from good. As long as good came first, everything else did not matter. A man might hold this view or that as best suited him, but by putting God first he was in agreement with everyone else who put good first. The description that mankind once spoke with one tongue means that there was a stage of man where good was in the first place, and so everyone spoke a common language. A stage of degeneration followed, represented by the building of the Tower of Babel to reach to heaven. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them fruely. And they had brick for stone, and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. Genesis 11, 1-4 Then follows an allegorical description of how they began to misunderstand one another, represented by their speaking in different languages, and how they were scattered. The first verse, And the whole earth was of one language and one speech, means that once mankind were in a certain state of unity on earth. The second verse, and it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, 
that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there means that they began to move away from that state of unity, i.e. they journeyed from the east. They moved away from the source of the state of unity and so at the same time descended in their level of being, i.e. they found a plain and dwelt there. They then began to invent notions of their own, being no longer in contact with the original source, i.e. come, let us make bricks, and they had bricks for stone and slime for mortar. Stone, as we have seen, represents truth. They had no longer truth. They had bricks for stone. That is something made by man in place of the word of God. Here they had bricks for stone. Having lost the stone, i.e. the truths originally taught, they proposed to burn bricks for themselves and build for themselves. They had slime for mortar, i.e. something evil in place of something good. They proposed to raise a tower even to heaven that is, to raise themselves to their level of God. Everything based on the self-love wishes to raise itself up, for the self-love only seeks to possess and have power over everything. It wishes to exalt itself, hence the image of the tower in the above parable. All this and what follows means that man began to think that he himself was the source of good, and not God. He committed the spiritual act called theft, which is referred to in the Eighth Commandment, Thou shalt not steal. He attributed to himself that which did not belong to him, and of that which he was not the cause. And this psychological theft has continued until today it has reached a remarkable growth, so much so that people tacitly attribute everything, even life, to themselves. As a result of this original theft, mankind no longer spoke a common language. The confusion of tongues took place. There was no longer a common language, that is, a man ceased to understand his neighbours, for there was no longer any common ground of understanding, which only a common perception of good can give. Babel replaced unity. This is the present state of things in the world, where man attributes everything to himself and has no sense of any other idea of the universe or of the meaning of mankind on earth. He attributes mind, thought, consciousness, feeling, volition, life, and in fact everything, to himself, although he is and must always remain incapable of explaining any one of these things. And his only explanation of the universe today is that it arose by chance and that it is meaningless. The Miracle at the Pool of Bethsaida this miracle is given only in the Gospel of John. The language of this Gospel is emotional. It is a very strange Gospel. It is quite wrong to suppose that we can understand it merely by reading it through once or twice. No one really knows for certain who the author is or when it was written. The portrait of Jesus Christ given in this Gospel is different from that given in the first three Gospels or so-called synoptic Gospels. The latter are called synoptic, not because they were written down by eyewitnesses, for Luke and Mark never saw Christ, but because, in a vague way, the historical narratives see eye to eye. But when we come to the Gospel of John, it is obvious that there is no attempt made to render the record of Christ's ministry on earth into a progressive historical narrative. Who was this John, whose name is appended to this Gospel? When was it published? No one can, for certain, answer these questions. Was the writer of this Gospel really the John mentioned who leaned on the bosom of Jesus, the disciple whom Jesus loved? Again, it is impossible to say. The whole language of this Gospel is strange, and in a certain sense, the figure of Jesus Christ appears in a strange light. Also, the very few miracles related in it, beginning with the transformation of water into wine, given in no other Gospel, are all strange. They are related in curiously full detail. Among other things, they are characterised by the use of number language or numerology. Let us begin by taking the long account of the miracle performed by Jesus at the pool of Bethsaida. This miracle, given only here, is the third miracle related in John, having been preceded by the transformation of water into wine and the healing of the nobleman's son at Capernaum. John chapter 5 verses 1 to 18 
After all these things there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethsaida, having five porches. In there lay a multitude of them that were sick, blind, halt, withered. And a certain man was there, which had been thirty and eight years in his, in his infirmity. When Jesus saw him lying, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wouldst thou be made whole? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Arise, take up thy bed and walk. And straightway the man was made whole, and took up his bed and walked. Now it was the Sabbath on that day, so the Jews said unto him, that was cured, it is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for thee to take up thy bed. But he answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? But he that was healed wist not who he was, for Jesus had conveyed him away, a multitude being in the place. Afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple, and said unto him, Behold, Thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing befall thee. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And for this cause did the Jews persecute Jesus, because he did these things on the Sabbath. You will see that the whole of this miracle is divided into two parts. The first is about the actual miracle, and the second part about the reaction of the Jews to the miracle. But the first part is again divided into two parts. Jesus said, Wouldst thou be made whole? And then he says, Take up thy bed and walk. Now let us look at the various things said before the miracle takes place. For we may be quite sure in regard to the ancient language of parables that everything said has a particular significance. A multitude lies sick in a certain place called a gate for sheep and this has five porches. In these five porches lie a multitude of them that were sick, blind, halt and withered. We know already that in the language of parables, the sick, the halt and the paralysed and so on represent psychological states. Now in the miracles given in John's Gospel, the number five occurs again in connection with the woman of Samaria who had five husbands and to whom Christ spoke at the well. He told her she had had five husbands and that her present husband was not her real husband. And then he spoke to her of living water, that is living truth, which Christ said, if once a man drank of it, he should not thirst. And she said, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come all the way hither to draw. It's from John chapter 4, verse 15. When we receive teaching that is not of the external world at all, that is, not of the five senses, which render to us the external world, the world of the senses, it is a matter of the greatest difficulty to accept it. And even if we do accept it, we still live very close to the five senses, that is, we still remain close to all the ideas belonging to the external world as rendered by our senses, which we cannot help taking for reality. The senses give us time and space, for example, and we think in terms of time and space and cannot get beyond this sense-based thinking. Our deepest thought is beyond all time and space, but our ordinary thought is, as it were, framed in terms of time and in terms of space, and we do not know how to think in a new way, apart from these sensible categories. Even if we assent to the idea of eternity where there is no time or space, we cannot grasp it. Even if we hear of a teaching that lies beyond the categories of time and space, we cannot grasp its eternal meaning, because we cannot think in terms of timelessness or spacelessness. So we lie close to the five porches of the senses, and although knowing another kind of teaching, and even seeing its truth, yet we cannot get away from the power of the external world and its sense-given reality. Here, then, lie the multitude of those who have entered into the sheep gate and remain close to the porches of the five senses. And they are crippled, being neither in one world nor another. So they are sick, blind, lame and withered, for they cannot psychologically move one way or the other. 
yet their eyes are fastened on the miraculous waters of the pool, which at intervals is stirred into life, and they are healed one by one, according to their power of getting into the pool when the angel stirs it. The pool, that is, the waters, means as always in the language of parables the truth of the word. All these people gathered round the truth of the word of God cannot get it into it properly. They are too close to the realities of life, to the visible appearance of things, that is, to thought based on sense. We are like the multitude of those lying close to the five porches in the miracle, awaiting something to strike belief into living meaning. And here lie all who have accepted truth of a higher order, which demands a new way of thinking, and who still are close to their ordinary way of thinking. They have accepted the word, the truth about inner evolution and rebirth, and cannot do it. So they lie close to natural truth, and yet looking at spiritual truth, and as it were in between two orders of truth, the truth of the five senses, and the truth of the word of God. So the man in the miracle is represented as lying in a bed. Psychologically a man lies in his beliefs and opinions, he lies in the truth he has received but cannot walk in it, that is, he cannot live and do it. So Christ says, take up thy bed and walk. Christ represents here the power that can be given to a man to walk in, to live, to do what he knows is the truth. Jesus takes the place of the angel stirring the water of truth and making it living truth. Jesus always represents, in miracles, the power of good acting on truth and making it living. A man can only make truth alive by seeing its good, and if he perceives the good of the truth taught him, he acts spontaneously from his will. A man is internally both his truth and his will. A man is truth only acts slowly from truth, but if he sees the good of his truth, he acts instantly from his will because his will passes instantly into what he perceives as good and only reluctantly into what he sees merely as truth. The whole man is his truth and his will passing into his good. This is why the man in the miracle of the pool of Bethsaida says to Jesus, When asked if he could be made whole, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. He describes his disease, which makes him psychologically halt, lame and withered. He is always too slow, he is always second, never first. A man who acts only from truth is acting from what is second in him. If he acts from his will, he is acting from what is first in him. Jesus gives him the power of acting from his will, that is, power to take up the bed of truth he lies in and walk and do it and live it. Jesus separates him from the world, from the power of the senses, and makes him see the truth he has been taught in a living way. So the man is cured of his psychological disease, the disease of higher truth being paralysed by lower truth. All this was done on the Sabbath, that is, on a day which, in the language of parables, means complete separation from the world and its cares. Part 3 The words Christ and Jesus have different meanings in the Gospels. We can be quite certain that every word used in the Gospel has its special significance which relates to the ancient language of parables. Jesus has one meaning, Christ has another meaning. The phrase Jesus Christ is used only twice in the Gospels, in each case by John. At all other times the name Jesus is used or the word Christ. Now Christ refers to the side of the truth of the word of God, that is the truth that can guide a man to inner self-evolution. And the word Jesus always refers to the good of the truth. The good and the truth are united in Jesus Christ. In the words of John, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 verse 17. The Gospel of John is written from good, or the marriage of good with truth. For this reason, at the very beginning of John's Gospel, the grace and truth of Jesus Christ are contrasted with the truth, the law of Moses, represented by John the Baptist, and almost immediately afterwards the marriage feast at Cana of Galilee follows with the miracle of the transformation of water into wine. 
In this parable of the man miraculously healed at the pool of Bethsaida, it is said that Jesus spoke to him. That is, internally, the good of the knowledge that the man had in him speaks to him. All teaching belonging to the higher level of man must begin on the side of truth before the good of it can be realised. Here Jesus acts as the good of the teaching about self-evolution, which the man knew of because he was not quite an external life, but drawn back from its power, and so within the five porches, and looking eagerly at the miraculous waters that can heal him. Jesus gives the man the will to do what he already knows as truth by making him see the good of it. And as all truth must lead to its own good, to be truth, and as this takes place in stages, step by step, until the understanding of truth leads to the final good of it, so it is said that Jesus, representing the final realisation of the good of the truth, heals on the final or seventh day. So Jesus, as representing the good of the teaching of Christ, heals on the Sabbath. The Jews are brought in here as objecting for many reasons, one being that they signify people who hold only to truth itself and do not care about the good to which it can lead. It does not mean here merely the Jews as people who hold to the literal Mosaic laws. It means far more than that. It means those who cannot get beyond knowledge as such and who dispute and argue from truth, from doctrines and theories and care nothing for good itself. The good of knowledge, the good of truth, is a stage very difficult to reach by anyone. But once a man reaches it, he begins to act from the final stage of truth and the first stage of good, when the meaning and inner sense and connections of all he has been taught step by step passes into realisation and truth becomes transformed into the good of it. The man no longer thinks now of the stages of truth that have led him up to this higher level of good, this clear inner perception of what is the good of all he has learned. Now he will act instantly through the feeling of good. He will not have to consult and remember the truth. If truth, if knowledge, does not lead to the goodness or use of it, which is its genuine partner, for what reason should we seek to study any truth or knowledge? Knowledge is endless unless it leads to its own goal, which is its goodness. Good is the culmination of truth. So Jesus as good stands at the culmination of truth, where it passes into the perception of its good and finds its true union. Here, as such, he performs always the miracles that transform truth into good, and so he cures the halt, lame, withered, blind, that is, all those who stand only in truth and cannot even begin to see that all doctrine, all truth, all knowledge must lead to good to have any meaning. To follow knowledge alone for its own sake is to misunderstand not only the meaning of life and of oneself, but of the universe. For the universe, understood psychologically, is both the truth of things and the good of things. When a man acts from the sense of the good of whatever truth he knows, he acts directly from his will, from what he wants, for we will good, but think truth. In the miracle at the pool of Bethsaida, the man, feeling only the truth of a teaching beyond the life of this world, could not bring his will, or sense of good, to act first. He lay down close to the senses, close to the literal meaning of the word of God. Yet he looked towards the miraculous meaning, the pool stirred by the angel, but could not grasp it. He lay in truth, but could not walk upright in it. Jesus, as the good of the truth the man lay in, raises him up. The man sees the good of all he has known, merely as truth. Then his will, his desire, passes into all he knows, and he begins to live his truth as good. Truth was first, because it must be. A man must first learn truth. But the good of truth is prior to truth. For all truth only can come from good. So truth is really second to its good. But in time and space a man must learn everything the wrong way round. We must learn truth first before we perceive and reach its good. The man who lay in truth by the side of the pool of Bethsaida put truth first and kept on doing so, and so was always second, always too late. He was second because he took truth as first. Jesus, as the realisation of the good of truth, healed him. The man then put good first and truth second and was healed. 
The miracle is about this deep question of first and second and its reversal. And the reversal makes good first and truth second. Then the man is made whole because the wholeness of truth lies in the realisation of its good. The miracle means supremely that a man, however much truth he knows, cannot act from it with his will unless he sees its good, and this is the last stage of truth, called the Sabbath, where good comes first. So he sins, being in truth alone and regarding truth as first. He misses the mark, taking truth as an end. He puts truth first and not as a means to goodness. So Jesus says to him, sin no more. This means in the Greek, miss the mark no more. All sin, as translated, is in the Greek, to miss the mark. And in this parable or miracle, the missing of the mark or sin refers to putting truth first and not seeing that it is a means to an end, which is the goodness of truth and the practice of truth from the goodness it leads to, and not from itself as mere truth, as mere doctrine and ritual. For a man who acts only from truth, from doctrine, from ritual, sins, that is, he misses the whole idea of the teaching about inner evolution, about rebirth, about regeneration. He misses the whole point of the Gospels. Consider for a moment all those who historically have acted from truth without goodness. Consider religious history and its horrors and hatreds in this respect. And then think that the real meaning of sin is to miss the mark. Jesus healed the man at the pool of Bethsaida, which means house of mercy. When good comes first, a man acts from mercy and grace. Then he is made whole. When he is whole, he no longer misses the mark. When Jesus is parting from the man whom he has healed, he says to him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more. The Good Samaritan To a certain extent, everyone asks for good, as when a man puts an extra coal on the fire if it is cold. He does not expect any reward save the good of the action. But nothing is more difficult to understand than what it means to act from good in the sense of the Gospels, although the meaning is as practical and non-sentimental as putting on a coal if it is cold. To act from truth, from knowledge, is easy to grasp. But truth by itself is merciless, and those who act from truth alone are capable of doing the greatest harm to others. Let us glance at the parable of the Good Samaritan, which has had perhaps a greater effect on mankind than any of the other parables. It is most known. It can be understood as it stands. In fact, no other parable has passed as it has into common knowledge. This parable is about acting from good and not from truth. A Jew is lying wounded by robbers on the dangerous road between Jerusalem and Jericho. A Jewish priest pass and a Levite pass, and they do not help him. A Samaritan then passes, and though the Jews and Samaritans have, on the side of truth, nothing to do with one another, he stops and binds up the wounds of this injured man. The parable is given after the lawyer, seeking to tempt Christ, has asked him what he should do to inherit eternal life. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbour as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbour? Jesus made answer and said, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, which both stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance a certain priest was going down that way, and when he saw him he passed by on the other side. And in like manner a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him he was moved with compassion and came to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on them oil and wine, and he set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. 
and on the morrow he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, I, when I come again, will repay thee. Which of these three, thinkest thou, proved neighbour unto him that fell among the robbers? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. And Jesus said unto him, Go and do thou likewise. That's from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. To act from compassion, to act from mercy, is to act from good itself and not from any idea of reward. Truth alone has nothing to do with compassion, nothing to do with mercy. The most merciless and atrocious acts have been done in the name of truth. For truth, divorced from good, has nothing real in it. It has nothing to check it, nothing to unite with it and give it any real being. The labour is in the vineyard. On more than one occasion, Christ makes use of the phrase, Many that are last shall be first, and the first last. In one place, these words are used after the disciples have shown that their idea of the kingdom of heaven is earthly, in accordance with the appearance of things with which they are familiar on earth. Christ has been speaking about how difficult it is for one who is rich to enter the kingdom. He is speaking of being rich in contrast to the state of little children who are innocent because they have not yet acquired their false ideas of themselves. The disciples have taken his words literally. Peter exclaims, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. What shall we have? And it is exactly this question that all people ask and will always ask who do not yet understand anything. What shall we have? they demand, as if they had something already as if they were actually rich. Christ answers his disciples on the level of their comprehension. He promises them that they shall sit on thrones and judge the tribes of Israel. This is said in irony, but the irony is vowed in view of what he is going to say. He answers, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Matthew 19, verse 28. Then he adds, as if it were an afterthought, But many shall be last that are first, and first that are last. Matthew 19, verse 30. And straightway he goes on to contradict what he has just said to his disciples, owing to the lack of understanding of what the kingdom is like, and what a man must be like to attain it. In the form of a parable, he shows them how all earthly ideas of being first, of rewards, and of what we call justice, of precedence, are non-existent at that level of understanding, which is the kingdom. But many shall be last that at first, and first that are last. For the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire labourers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the labourers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour, and saw others standing in the marketplace idle. And to them he said, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing, and he saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard. And when even was come, the lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the labourers and pay them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. And when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they received it, they murmured against the householder, saying, these last have spent but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. But he answered and said to one of them, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? Take up that which is thine, and go thy way. It is my will to give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own, or is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. Matthew, chapter 19, verses 30. 
This parable is the real answer to Peter's question, what shall we have? The kingdom of heaven, Christ says, is not as you think, and it is impossible to think concerning it as to what you shall have. It is not something that can be thought of in terms of rewards as men understand them. To think of it as a place where a man should be given a throne and power and authority over others, as a reward for anything he has given up in this life, is to think of it from ideas that have nothing to do with it. The kingdom is different from anything on earth, different from anything a man's senses can show him, different from anything he can think. A new understanding is necessary, born from the ideas that man at the level of earth does not possess. So Christ continually begins by saying that the kingdom of heaven is like unto. And in each parable a new idea is introduced, an idea that no one on earth would naturally possess or could possibly think of for himself. For in passing from the level of understanding technically called earth in the Gospels to the level called heaven, the whole basis of a man's thoughts must change. But no one's thoughts can change unless he has new ideas, for he thinks from his ideas. No one can think in a new way with his old ideas, and there can be no change of mind, no repentance, if a man's ideas remain at the level of the earth, where his ideas are based on appearances, on things that are seen. To understand anything about the kingdom, his natural ideas must be left, or rather transcended. For while with his natural ideas he can understand the world and its kingdoms, he cannot understand the higher level of the kingdom of heaven. He cannot even begin to understand a single thing about it, for the lower level cannot comprehend the higher. What is the central idea of the difficult parable of the labourers that is quite new and strange and does not correspond with our natural ideas? It is the injustice of the parable that strikes our level of understanding. According to our standards of thinking, those who had worked longer should naturally have a greater reward. And no doubt some of the disciples felt the same, believing that they had been the first call to labour in the vineyard represented by Christ's teachings on earth. The teaching had been first given to the Jews and to the disciples in particular. It was natural for the latter to expect the greatest reward. It was a natural idea. But in order to understand the psychological meaning of the parable, the central idea must be grasped, for a parable always contains an idea that is not a natural one, and one which may even contradict any natural idea that we possess. It is easy to understand the disciples' idea of the kingdom. They had a natural idea of it, derived from life, and Christ knew this and answered them in terms of it when he told them that they would sit on thrones and judge others. But the parable he went on to give, or to give them, cannot be related to any natural idea. Our natural ideas of justice and injustice are amongst the most powerful ideas we have. We are aroused by them more than by anything else. And the human standpoint is presented in the parable in the shape of the labourers who were called first, who expected they would receive more, and murmured against the householder, saying, These last have spent but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. The answer is, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Did thou not agree with me for a penny? And no doubt they would say yes, but we did not know what would happen. It is gross injustice. What is the key to that parable? It is found in the passages preceding it and in the parable itself. It lies in the definition given of the householder into whose vineyard the labourers are called stage by stage. Who is the householder that is at the head of things? The householder is good. He is defined as, I am good. The householder says, Is it not lawful for me to do what I will of mine own? Or is thine e I evil because I am good? The whole parable is about acting from the idea of good and not from the idea of reward. For if a man acts from good itself, he does not seek a reward, for he no longer acts from his self-love or the idea of merit. To act from good makes all who do so equal. To act from seeing the good of what one does cannot produce any feeling of rivalry or envy. Nor can it create any feeling that a reward should be expected, for to act from good is its own reward. And to act from seeing the good of what one does has nothing to do with length of service or any period of time, 
for good is above time. For God is defined as good and God is outside all time. The source of good is outside time, in eternity. The parable is about eternal values. It is not about time. It has nothing to do with our natural ideas derived from time and eternity. In a passage coming a little earlier, where the rich man comes to Christ and says, Master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? The answer is, Why askest thou me concerning that which is good? One there is who is good. Only God is good. No man is good. All goodness, everything that is good, the goodness of anything, whatever it be, is from God. The rich man is rich because he feels he has kept all the commandments. He feels merit. He feels himself justified and so rich by acting from truth, by having observed all the commandments. Yet perhaps he seems uncertain, for he begins now to ask about good and how to act from good. What good thing shall I do? So in one account it is said that Jesus looked on him and loved him. Truth is first and good is last. Then the order is inverted and good is first and truth last when the man acts from good. The rich man is told to sell all he has and follow Jesus. To act from good in place of truth a man must sell all his feelings of merit, all self-evaluation, all sense that he is good, all sense that he is first. For if he thinks he is good, he will act from himself, from his self-love, and that is why it is said that only God is good. In Luke it is said, none is good save one, even God. And that's from chapter 18, verse 19. All good is from God, not from man. If a man thinks that he is good, he will inevitably seek a reward for all he does, for he will ascribe good to himself. He will not see good as a false passing into all things. He will feel he has acted well, especially if he has given up something in order to do a good action. He will be like Peter who says, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. What then shall we have? And in thinking of the parable of the labourers, it becomes plain from what follows that the disciples did not understand what it meant, because a few verses later, after the parable had been given and the disciples had listened to it, they became indignant because the mother of the sons of Zebedee comes and asks Jesus if they may sit on his right hand and his left hand in the kingdom of heaven. They are still thinking in terms of rewards and power. Christ calls the disciples and says, Ye know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Not so shall it be among you, but whosoever would be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever would be first among you shall be your servant. Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 to 27. And he has already given the explanation of what this means, namely that if a man begins to act from the good of what he does and the love of good itself, he will serve good and be a servant of good, and all, di all ideas of authority, place and position, and all ideas of being superior to others, all rivalry, all personal envy and jealousy, and all human ideas of justice and injustice will become non-existent for him. For good is not a person, and to act from seeing the good of what one does and taking pleasure in it is to act beyond anything personal. The New Man by Maurice Nicole Chapter 5 The Idea of Righteousness in the Gospels Part 1 let us take some examples from the Gospels of Christ's teaching about what it is necessary to do in order to approach a higher level of man and at the same time let us find some meaning for one or two phrases used by Christ which are not quite clear. Christ says in one place, Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no ways enter into the kingdom of heaven. And that's from the Gospel of Matthew. This is a definite statement, having a definite meaning. What does righteousness mean? And what does it mean that one's righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees? The word translated in the above passage as exceed implies, in the original, being over and above, and so uncommon or remarkable. 
It is not the same kind of righteousness as that of the scribes and Pharisees that must be increased. A man must have another and a remarkable or unusual kind of righteousness over and above this righteousness. Righteousness in its primitive meaning was used of a man who observed the rules or customs of the society he lived in. A man behaved rightly by keeping the laws. Among the Jews, righteousness was a matter of the observation of all the minute details of the Levitical law with regard to all its ceremonies, tithes, outer purifications and so on. This form of external righteousness was many times the subject of attack by Christ. It was false righteousness in terms of what Christ was teaching because it was done before men. It had no other object than to appear right outwardly in the eyes of other people. Christ said, Take heed that ye do not your arms before men to be seen of them. O oh, she have no reward of your father which is in heaven. When therefore thou doest arms, sound not a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have received their reward. But when thou doest arms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine arms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall recompense thee. As Matthew chapter 6 verses 1 to 4 In the above passage Christ is saying that the practice of this form of outer righteousness keeps a man where he is, in his own vanity and self-admiration. Christ is teaching about how a man can evolve, how he can become a new man. In attacking the form of righteousness belonging to the scribes and Pharisees, he is attacking the level of a man where everything he does is for the sake of his own merit and not for its own sake. Such a man justifies himself by outward acts and behaviour. To justify oneself means to make out that one is guiltless. In everyone there is a very complex mental process continually at work, the object of which is to make a man feel he is in the right, that he is guiltless. Unless he has begun to have any deeper conscience than that of conformity to outer customs and law, of keeping up appearances or not losing face as the term is, it does not matter to him what he really has done. He will justify himself in order that his external righteousness may be maintained in the eyes of the world, that is, before men. This keeps him at a certain level of development. This is why Christ attacks this form of feeling one is in the right. The object of the teaching of the Gospels is that man should internally evolve and reach a higher level. For this reason she said that unless a man's righteousness is of a quite different order from that of the scribes and the Pharisees, he cannot reach this higher level called the kingdom of heaven. Heaven always means this higher inner state or level possible for a man to reach. Remember that the Gospels only speak of an inner evolution possible for man. The scribes and Pharisees do not mean people who lived long ago, but people today who are at a certain level, who ascribe merit to themselves in all they do and are charmed by themselves and like themselves above everyone else. They have only self-love in their emotional development as distinct from love of neighbour. All self-love despises others. To appreciate that another has a real existence apart from yourself and what you want is to begin to get beyond the level of emotional development called self-love. What then does it mean that man's righteousness must transcend that of the scribes and Pharisees? It will depend upon what a man justifies himself by. It will depend upon what a man seeks to live by, that is, on what order of truth he seeks to follow. If he only justifies himself in the eyes of the world, he will be one kind of man inwardly. The order of truth taught in the Gospels is different from that of the world and the realities of the senses. There was always a great deal of argument amongst those who heard Christ. In John an example of this is given. Some said, He is a good man. Others said, Not so, but he leadeth the multitude astray. 
The point is that Christ offended the majority of people who heard him. His words were not only too strange, but too strong for them to accept, and so they were offended. Everyone is offended when what he justifies himself by is taken away from him. Christ was teaching another order of truth, another order of what can make a man feel right in himself. He was teaching about the passage from one level of a man to another level of himself. He was speaking all the time about this higher level called the kingdom of heaven, but even his disciples thought he was speaking about the world and a kingdom on earth. So when Christ said that a man's righteousness must be something utterly different from that of the scribes and Pharisees, he was speaking of what righteousness means in terms of this higher level and how a man must behave in regard to it. A man, in view of this higher level of himself, could no longer behave in the same way or seek his rewards from the same source and feel himself guiltless by the same means. He had to realise that in view of the kingdom of heaven, all his self-righteousness was useless and could lead to nothing. When a man receives teaching about inner evolution, he can no longer justify himself as he has done. He can no longer blind himself by his former self-justification to what he really is, in the light of the new order of truth he has learnt. In the passage quoted above it is said, But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. This is spoken in reference to this other kind of righteousness, through which entry to the kingdom of heaven is only possible. What does it mean? In the previous verse it is emphasised that a person must not do his alms to be seen of men, as do the scribes and Pharisees. Alms signify what you do out of mercy. This does not mean only charitable acts, it means inner forgiveness, inner cancelling of debts against others. In the ancient language of parables, the left hand denotes evil and the right hand good. In the parable of the separation of the sheep from the goats, at the consummation of the age, not the end of the world, it is said that the sheep are set on the right hand and the goats on the left. In the above passage, not letting the left hand know what the right hand doeth refers to two levels in man which must be made distinct. Notice that you must not let the left hand know what the right does, not the other way round. Man at his ordinary level is evil, and here it means a man sunk in his own self-love and vanity, and a creature of the senses. The senses are the world. The right hand means a higher, or the beginning of a higher level of understanding. He must not mix these two levels, that is, he must not let his left hand know what his right hand does. The left hand is the lower level dominated by self-love. What a man does from a higher level must be kept away from a lower level. In acts of inner mercy, in doing his alms, a man must not act from the idea of reward, for to do so is to act from the level in him called the scribes and Pharisees, the level of the world, the lower level. He must act beyond this level for the sake of doing good, and not let what he has done in this respect become a matter of praise and so nourish his vanity and self-love and self-righteousness. But more than this, he must not even think about what he has done or converse with himself about it and congratulate himself on his noble behaviour. Otherwise, what he has done will pass into meritoriousness, even although no one knows about it. It will drop down to that level in himself he will begin to congratulate himself, to fall back, as it were, on his merit. He must know what it means to keep silence in himself. He must not talk to himself of what he has done. But, as a rule, when a man does good of any kind, he longs that others should know it, and so he cannot keep silence either in himself or in regard to others. He acts before an audience, both internal and external. Christ speaks first of not acting before an external audience and then about not acting before an internal audience, called here the left hand, which is the lower level or life level in him. Once we understand that everything said in the Gospels is about reaching a higher and a possible level in a man, 
the meaning of the left and right becomes clear. Left is the lower level and right the higher level. A man on the lower level acting from the left hand feels merit and wishes to justify himself by his charitable actions and have his reward. This is one form of righteousness. But a man beginning to behave from a higher level, from the right hand, seeks no reward, for he acts from what he sees internally is good, and for the sake of what is good itself, so seeking no reward either from within or without, comes into a righteousness over and above that of the scribes and Pharisees. He does not speak to others of what he has done, nor does he tell himself how well he behaved. Both towards the outer audience and the inner, he is silent. This is what is meant by the phrase, Unless your righteousness shall exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no ways enter into the kingdom of heaven. If a man's righteousness does not exceed in this respect, he is kept on a lower level of himself inevitably. This teaching, seen in the light of the lower and higher levels in a man, becomes practical in its meaning, as does also the significance of left and right hand. And it is also perhaps possible to understand to some extent what is meant that another and a hidden reward may come spoken of in the sentence. And thy father which seeth in secret shall recompense thee in secret. An extraordinary misunderstanding of the meaning of these words of Christ is found in the authorised version where it is said, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. It is obvious that the scribe who altered the words in transcription had not any idea of their meaning and could not understand any reason for doing alms secretly save for external reward and for the sake of feeling meritoriousness and self-satisfaction and so could not refrain from adding that alms done in secret would be rewarded openly. And perhaps at this point you might try to understand why it is that so often people, not perceiving that the Gospels are about rebirth of a higher level of man, take everything said in them on their own level, and so mix up two orders or levels of truth. To take the Gospels apart from their central idea of rebirth, which means an inner evolution and implies the existence of a higher level, is to understand nothing of their real meaning. People will then only think of justifying themselves in terms of themselves as they are and the world they know, not understanding that another birth of themselves is demanded, a new form of themselves, not simply an increase of what they are already. And in spite of the fact that the kingdom of heaven, that is the highest possible level of a man, is said to be within and to be the object of final attainment, they think that it refers to some state after death, in future time, and not to a state attainable, or at least to be striven after, in this life on earth, a new state of themselves that actually exists as a possibility, now as something above what one is, like a room on the next floor of this house that is oneself, to which so many references are made in the parables. In consequence of this misunderstanding, people cannot separate the left hand from the right, and as a result, Anything they do runs, as it were, into the lower level and takes the wrong form. And often this is the cause of absurd, distressing or even evil examples of religious life, owing to the ascribing of what is higher to what is lower and the mixing up of two orders of ideas. It is like an acorn taking to itself all the teaching about an oak tree and imagining it is an oak tree as it is. From all this, we can realise that no one can continue to justify himself in the way he has always done and expect to become another and a new man. His feeling of his own righteousness must change, for as long as he feels that he is righteous as he is, he cannot change. His whole idea of what it means to be righteous must change, because it is exactly people's feeling of being righteous, of being in the right, that prevents them from changing. They are satisfied with themselves. It is only others who are wrong, not themselves. And it is also their feeling of being already righteous and in the right that determines their special forms of justifying themselves. From this they derive their feeling or worth and merit. And it is just here that they are more easily upset, more easily offended. 
Is anything more easy than being offended and giving offence? This is the human situation. The extraordinarily harsh teaching of the Gospels is to break this feeling of merit and complacency that everyone openly or secretly rests upon, and this is the source of being offended. In the light of the idea of the Kingdom of Heaven, in view of this possible inner evolution, of this higher level, a man must come to realise that he is almost nothing as he is, and that all his vanity, merit, conceit, self-esteem, self-liking, self-satisfaction and self-love, and all his imagination of himself is practically an illusion. It is indeed only possible to understand that harsh teaching of Christ in view of its aim, which is to break up a man's whole psychology, the man as life has made him, the man he regards himself as, and make him think and feel and act in a new way, so that he begins to move towards a higher level, towards another state of himself that exists within himself as a possibility. For to pass from one level to another, from the state of an acorn to the state of a tree, everything must be rearranged and altered. All a man's ordinary relations with different sides of himself must alter. The whole setting of his being must change. The whole man must change. For this reason, Christ said, I came not to bring peace but a sword, for I came to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes should be those of his own household. Matthew chapter 10 verses 34 to 36 This has not an external, a literal meaning. It signifies an internal upheaval, a change in a man's whole psychology, a change in all that in him is father, mother, daughter, daughter-in-law, mother-in-law and so on, in him, psychologically. All his relationships to himself must change, and this means that all his ideas about himself and his whole feeling of himself must change. A man's household means all that is in the man himself, not his body, but his psychology, the household of all the different sides of himself. All the ideas, all the attitudes, there were the father or mother of his thoughts and views and opinions, and all the relationships resulting from them must change in view of the sword, which is the power of truth, of a higher order. Meeting this higher order of truth, a man can no longer be at peace with himself as he is. He must think in a new way, and no one can think in a new way merely by adding some extra knowledge to what he already thinks. The whole man must change, that is, his whole mind must change. First of all, this parable refers to the starting point of Christ's teaching, to metanoia, to a man beginning to think beyond how he always thought, to think in an entirely new way about himself and his meaning and his aim. It is not repentance, as translated, but new thinking, over and above all that he thought before. In the same way, the righteousness that Christ speaks of is over and above and beyond all that a man has justified himself by and regarded as being his righteousness, his idea of being right. It is indeed meta-righteousness. Part 2 Throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Christ is speaking of what connects a man with another order of life and by what means force or bliss, from this higher level can reach him. In the Beatitudes he says in one place, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst are for righteousness, for they shall be filled. To be blessed means to attain bliss. It means an actual state that can be attained, and not an abstract merit, a mark in one favour, in some moral account book. The word in the original was used by the Greeks to describe the state of the gods. In this passage, to hunger and thirst after righteousness refers to a righteousness different from self-righteousness, which only regards itself in its own object. To find this other righteousness, a man must lose himself, that is, his ideas of himself and his value and merit. Let us study the meaning of a passage referring to this idea of losing oneself. It occurs in the description of the incident 
where Christ wheels round suddenly on Peter, calling him a stumbling block because he always took what was said in terms of earthly good. Peter mixed up things on different levels. He did not understand the meaning of not letting the left hand know what the right hand is doing. He mixed the truth of Christ's teaching in his mind with the things of men. When Christ tells his disciples of his forthcoming death, Peter says, Far be it from thee, Lord, this shall never be unto thee. Christ then says to him, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art a stumbling block unto me, for thou mind not the things of God, but the things of men. This shows why Peter is called Satan. Here is one of the definitions of what Satan means in the Gospels. It is mixing up different levels in thinking, for to mind here means to think. Christ then says, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever would save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. Matthew 16, verses 24 to 25. Life here means soul in the original. A man must lose his soul. When it is said that a man must lose his life, something more complicated is meant here than dying physically. In John, Christ says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. But in the original we find soul, not life. A man must lay down his soul, and this is the supreme definition of conscious love. He must put his friends, literally in the Greeks, those whom he loves, beyond himself or in a place of himself. Christ in this passage speaks of what this means in terms of obedience to what he teaches. A servant, he says, obeys his master, not knowing what the master means. But a friend is one who understands and obeys through understanding, so he says, Ye are my friends. They are his friends if they obey the order of truth of which Christ spoke. To obey is to act beyond one's own interests, to put something over and above them. A man cannot lose his soul if he only minds the things of men. The soul in a man can be related to a lower or a higher level. A man must lose his soul in regard to its relationship to a lower level of himself in order to find it at a higher level. It is only by understanding the double meaning of the phrase to lose the soul that many sayings about the soul in the Gospels can be understood. Take, for example, the phrase For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? By gaining the whole world, by minding only the things of men, he loses his soul in regard to a possible inner evolution of himself. Remember that everything in the Gospels refers to an inner evolution, the result of which is the attainment of the kingdom of heaven. The soul of a grub is not at the level of a butterfly, and so it must lose its soul to find it again. By remaining a grub, it saves its soul as a grub, but loses its soul in another sense. That is, it loses the opportunity of transformation and by clinging to itself as it is, misses all that belongs to what it can become. And since man is also capable of transformation or rebirth, his soul is double in the same sense. He can keep it and remain as he is, but by keeping it, he loses it in regard to its real destiny. Or he can lose it by not remaining as he is, and then he will find it again at another level of his own inner evolution. Therefore the soul is a potentiality. That is, it is not a fixed thing, but is both what a man is and what he may become. In translating the word soul by the word life, as in the above passage, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, it is correct if we understand by the word life not physical vital life, the life of the body, but the level of himself he is at. Understand that the life of a man is not the outer life of his physical body, but all he thinks and desires and loves. This is a man's life and this is his soul. The soul is the image of the life. But a man can begin to live differently in himself, 
he can begin to think differently and feel differently and desire differently and love differently. That is, his own relationship to himself can change so that what he went with in his thoughts and consented to in his desires, in short, all that he once thought was true and felt was good, can change. If this happens, the man has another relationship to himself internally. His life in himself then begins to change. As said already, this is what Christ meant when he said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man at variance against his father, and a man's foes should be those of his own household. A man who, through the teaching of the word, that is, through another order of truth belonging to a higher level, begins to think in a new way and feel in a new way and see his aim and meaning in a new way, can no longer consent to all he previously thought and felt and desired and aimed at. For what a man consents to in himself makes his life, and that is his soul. His household, that is, himself, must undergo upheaval. He can no longer be at peace with himself. He must lose his former relationship to himself. And this means he must lose his soul. For the soul is the man's life as a whole, and the man's life is what he related to in himself being what he believes is true and right and consents to as desirable, what he serves in himself, what he thinks is right, what he feels is good. So it is possible to realise that to lay down one's life means to cease to live as one has lived, but to begin to live in another way, and that it does not mean to be killed. It means indeed the reverse, to begin to live. At the same time, it means that the soul must be lost, for otherwise transformation is not possible, understanding that the soul means what a man has attached himself to in mind and desire and hitherto regarded as himself. When Christ told his disciples of the sufferings that they would have to endure when they taught the word, he said to them, In your patience ye shall win your souls. The Greek word for patience means staying behind, which can be interpreted as not going with one's desires, not going with oneself. By this means a man can lose his soul on one level and find it again at a higher level. So far we can understand that the soul in a man can be potentially, that is through its own powers, related to a lower or a higher level of himself. For a man to pass from a lower to a higher level in himself, his soul must change in what it relates the man himself to. If the man changes his position in himself, so his relation to himself changes and so his soul changes. From all this we can begin to realise that the soul in a man is not something beautiful or ready-made, but something that forms itself in him according to his life and that it is really all his life, the image of all he has thought and felt and done. The New Man by Maurice Nicole, Chapter 6, The Idea of Wisdom in the Gospels In many of the parables and sayings of Christ, a word is used which is translated as wise. For example, Christ said to his disciples on one occasion, Be ye wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Innocent means harmless, not doing any harm, and has not the moral, sentimental, western meaning of not knowing anything. It would indeed be impossible to be wise and at the same time not know anything. But the word translated as wise does not exactly mean wise so much as clever or practically intelligent. The Greek word is phronios, which meant in its earliest use being in one's right senses and so having presence of mind or having one's wits about one. Christ says in one place, the children of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of light. And this passage perhaps brings about more clearly than any other the meaning of the word. Worldly people in their kind or at their level are more practical, more shrewd and businesslike, more sargassious and knowing in regard to what they are aiming at than the children of light in regard to what they are aiming at. 
They have more presence of mind and in dealing with life are not silly or foolish. To know how to do and actually to do the right thing at the right time is to be phronimos. You will remember that the steward of unrighteousness, wrongly translated as the unjust steward, was called wise. This is phronimos, being commended by his Lord because he saw what to do in a very difficult situation and acted with great presence of mind. This word, phronimos, had therefore a strong, bracing, practical meaning. It is used in the Greeks to define the right action of an intelligent man, seeking a higher level of himself through inner evolution. Christ talks of those who are useless in this respect. He compares them with salt that has lost its savour and is not even fit for the dunghill. If the salt have lost its savour, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is fit neither for the land nor for the dunghill. Men cast it out. Luke chapter 14 verses 34-35 And here the word translated as have lost its savour means literally has been made foolish. The dunghill is life. People who imagine that believing sentimentally in the Gospels is all that is necessary are foolish. They are like the foolish man who built his house upon the sand in contrast to the wise man described as phronimos who built that is constructed for himself his house upon the rock and it fell not for it was founded upon the rock this means that the man was phronimos because he based himself on the permanent teaching of inner evolution called the word in the gospels and worked to build himself of his own house the house of himself upon the basis he did the work he acted from it he implied what he understood to his own life thus he based himself on the rock of truth rather on the shifting sands of life let us consider in this respect the parable of the ten virgins five of whom were wise phronimos and five foolish or silly this is a parable about reaching a higher level by inner evolution here called directly the kingdom of heaven then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterwards came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. That was Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 to 13. The wise virgins are distinguished from the foolish virgins by possessing oil in their lamps. Notice that they refuse to give their oil to the others, but tell them to go and buy it in life. All of them had lamps, but only half had oil in them, and these are called clever, or not silly. They are practical. They realise what was necessary in order to reach this higher level called here the bridegroom. What does it mean that they had oil? They are those who, in relation to Christ's teaching, have understood something that the others have not understood. And this is represented by their having oil in their lamps. The parable must be lifted entirely off its literal meaning. A lamp is to give light. But psychologically it means here something that can give light, not in a physical sense, but in the sense of light as used in the Gospel. The light that shines in the darkness of the mind. The light of new understanding coming from the Word. 
Christ came to give light to human beings who are described as living in darkness on this earth. They live in the light of the sun, but this is darkness in comparison with this other light comprehended only by the understanding. Christ called himself the light of the world. He meant this other light that can fall on the mind and illuminate the understanding. When a man lives only from his senses and takes the spectacle of outer life, lit up by the sun as his sole end, he is in darkness. John says the darkness does not comprehend the light, the lower does not understand the higher level. When a man becomes aware that he is internally incomplete and lost, and that the full meaning of his existence is to undergo a change, an inner evolution, and receives a new understanding about himself and what he has to do, he already begins to see the light, this real meaning of his creation. The word is about this real meaning, this light. Christ taught the word, and so is the light. The word is the teaching about the way to reach a new level where this light is shed, which lies over and above a man, but at the same time within him. Because the kingdom of heaven is within a man, he can only contact with it internally. The way is in himself, not outside. He can experience flashes of another consciousness, moments of entirely new meaning, which show that a higher level exists in him. They are moments of this light, but to reach this level permanently, a man must be taught the word and taught it first of all externally, via the senses. He must hear it, but this does not mean merely to hear it literally, but to begin to understand it, to hear it with his mind to ponder it, to think of its meaning, to take it into his inner consciousness and to see himself in the terms of what it teaches. For his mind must slowly be prepared in order to change because this higher level is different from a lower level and so the faults belonging to a lower level are not of the same order as those of a higher level. Something new must be formed in his mind to receive light so he must gradually come to think in a new way or repent as it is so wrongly translated. This gradual change in thinking forms the lamp in him. It is formed by the teaching of the word. But the lamp is not enough by itself. It cannot give light alone, but it is necessary as the first stage of inner evolution. The second stage in this parable is the stage of having oil in the lamp. This means that what he knows and sees as new truth must be applied. Christ said, Everyone that heareth these words of mine and doeth them shall be likened unto a wise man, and everyone that heareth these words of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man. Here the two words wise and foolish appear in the same sense as in the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. To act inwardly from the teaching of Christ, to begin to do it, to begin to work from the understanding of its meaning, to begin to use it and apply it to oneself practically, this is to be wise. This is to use the word intelligently. This is to be practically clever. And this gives oil in the lamp individually. But people can accept truth of this higher order and yet continue to act only from the level of life. They do not internally obey the new truth, the new knowledge they have learned, which comes from a higher level but they continue to obey life and it's good when it comes to the point. They have lamps, but no oil. These are called the foolish, who must go and buy oil from those who sell it. This means that they must continue to get the kind of oil gained from meritorious actions in life, which is the only kind of good they value. Those who sell it are those who tell you what is meritorious, what will pay best. To act from merit and reward makes one sort of oil. To act from the teaching of the word in its internally understood meaning is to act from a level higher than life, and nothing in outer life will reward you for such actions. The foolish virgins with lamps and no oil are those who are on one level of truth and knowledge intellectually, a higher level, but live and do according to another level. They know one thing and live and do another. These and the very nature of things shut themselves out from the kingdom of heaven. That is, 
from the attainment of this higher level possible to man, which is his real meaning. It is not that the door is shut on them. The door is not shut. They shut the door on themselves. The kind of oil they get from buying and selling, the oil of merit, is not that required for entry into another level of humanity. So they are said to be not clever. They are not clever because they do not see that it is to themselves and the kind of people they are that the teaching of Christ applies. They must not merely think in a new way through the ideas of the word, but must themselves become different kinds of people. They may know and even believe the truth on a higher level and at the same time live on another level, not applying the truth to themselves. This is their problem. Their actual lives are not governed by their knowledge. They know one thing and will another. In this parable, the wise virgins are those who actually seek to live from their own understanding of what they have been taught and seek the good of what they have been taught by practicing, by applying from their own wills, the knowledge to themselves. The foolish, on the other hand, knowing the teaching, continue to seek their good from life, from rewards, from reputation, from being first, get into higher and higher positions, having better morals than others, being thought well of, from outwardly conforming to laws and social standards, when internally they are quite different and are only restrained by fear. This is the only good they know and so they must follow it. And since the whole question lies in what a man deems is good, and because a man acts solely from what he deems is good, they are told to go to what they deem good and get at least that kind of oil, for this is all they can do. They are told to go to those who buy and sell this good. These foolish virgins return, but even so they find they are shut out and are told, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. They have no idea of acting from a form of good beyond life, beyond reward in life, for the sake of what they see is good in the light of a higher teaching of what is truth and good. So they shut themselves out because they mix up two different levels of knowledge as two different levels of good. If you look narrowly at what is meant by good in the Gospels, you will see what is meant. To bring down the teaching about higher man to the level of man as he is, to follow the idea of what is good from the basis of life and its rewards, its merits, its values, its insistence on reputation, outer appearances and so on, is to shut oneself out from the kingdom of heaven. Because a man beginning to reach the level of the kingdom of heaven does good for no reward in life, but from what he sees internally as good in the light of the truth of the word taught him. And it is of no use for any of us to pretend that we already know this kind of good and act from it. We act from life and its good, however much we know. To be a Christian, a man must will what Christ taught and do it. If he cannot see the good of what he is taught, he will not act from it. No matter how much knowledge is given and how true it is, he will not act from it unless he sees by his own inner understanding that it is desirable and good and begins to will its existence. A man is not merely his understanding, but what he wills from it. And this is what he does, and this is the whole man. The word, that is the psychological teaching in the Gospels, is to make a man different, first in thought and then in being, so that he becomes a new man. Merely to know about the word and to make one's oil, one's good, from the advantages, intrigues and merits of life, is not to have the oil that belongs to the lamp of Christ. To act from the word, to act from this teaching about inner evolution, this higher state of man, to begin to do a very few things in the light of Christ's words through seeing what they mean and liking the ideas and so being able to will them without any sense of reward is another matter. One single act done from willing some truth belonging to that order of teaching called the word will lift a man for a moment far beyond his usual level. In such an act there is no question of bargaining, no question of how much, no question of where do I come in, and no boasting about it afterwards. 
one such thing done in the purest part of your understanding because you see the necessity and reality and so the good of it. One such thing done from the inner will can begin to set in motion something that has hitherto remained silent and motionless. The seed starts to life. The man, as a seed on which the word can fall, begins to awaken. Light enters into his inner darkness. Truth is one thing, the spirit another, and a man must be reborn from water and spirit before he can become a new man. Water is the truth, the knowledge and teaching about a higher level, and spirit is a man's will passing into this knowledge and uniting it with him, through his seeing its good, its value. No amount of external teaching will bring about this result. A person may have a lamp, but only through his own most intimate will, only through his deepest consent, only through obeying in secret the knowledge that has formed the lamp in him, will he make oil for it. It is just here that everyone is free. It is just here that everyone, through an inner action, can evolve or not evolve.